Stipulations. When you woke up this morning, did you purposely say, I'm going to confine myself to a box? Or do you just avoid putting any conscious thought into today? When you're busy going at it, literally or figuratively, do you ever find yourself pausing for a moment to realize what's going on? Or are you just reacting? When you hear the saying, may I have your attention please, do you continue as you were, or do you consider the information you're about to receive might actually be valuable? When I was growing up, my mother used to ask me to do things, and sometimes her reasoning was, because I said so. Looking back, I wish perhaps I took the time to pause, think, and consider the ramifications of my choices. Good Tuesday to you. This is Tuesday, October 25th, 2016. This is episode number 32 of Pause, Think, Consider. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. This is our second episode with my good friend Mike Eford, personal trainer. If you didn't catch our previous episode which was on 25 Pounds of Excuses. I'll link to it on the the website. Highly recommend it. One of the more entertaining podcasts I think has been done in the 32 episodes that have been conducted. For today's episode, we're talking about the topic. Of course, we have a personal trainer here. We're talking about the topic of how to have a good workout, or what does having a good workout mean for you? How to have a successful workout, specifically. Not good, because good, if we're going to use Mike's analogy of using those SMART goals, it's not specific enough. So how to have a successful workout. It's going to be different for every person. For example, for somebody that's going through some serious recovery, maybe they were in a car wreck, and they've lost all mobility. They have to relearn how to walk. A great workout for them might be getting up from bed. I know we've got a personal acquaintance, friend of ours, complete torn Achilles. For him, right now, at his stage, he is a year one year, not quite to the day. I don't know where it is in the in the timeline. But for him, he is running a mile. That is a successful workout for him right now. For myself personally, it's going to be a little bit different. For my girlfriend, Jean, the peanut butter builder budget girl. Very different than me. And I know for Mike, he's got his own thing too, plus his clients. So for all information on this topic that we talk about today, you can go to the website, pausethinkconsider.com slash workout. So I want to get into with Mike, because he is very much a subject matter. I don't necessarily want to use the word expert. I don't like the word expert. I work in the internet marketing field. And everybody loves the cachet of a social media expert. Does that mean you're really great at tindering? What does that exactly mean? You know how to like. You know how to do a Snapchat and not be a Draymond Green and show your balls to all of America. What does that mean when you're a social media expert? So he's not a fitness expert. Fitness is his passion. He just happens to get paid for it. And he enjoys it. Very rare. Not a bad gig. gig. So, I want to get into, just from a definition standpoint, Mike, what is 
a successful workout. And for your, for yourself, your clients, other individuals that are listening, which is probably just my mom and my girlfriend, but if we stretch beyond that, what is a successful workout? Well, thanks, Jesse, for having me back again and pause, thank you, consider. As you said, successful workout means something different for everyone. Let's go back. I was working for 24-Hour Fitness. One of my mentors at 24-Hour Fitness was like, hey, Mike, you need to build the workouts for your clients before they walk through the door today. That way you're all ready to go. You don't have to worry about what are you going to do when they get here. Just have them prepared. And I knew what he was doing for me at the time. He was making it so I don't have to put too much cranial energy into what we're going to do that day for the client when they show up. I hated it. I hated pre-programming workouts for people because Tom would come in. He'd have Monday would be chest day, Tuesday would be leg day, so on and so forth. We just had a program set up for him. But invariably, I'd write out a workout for Tom and I'd write out this great chest workout, spend 30 minutes and be like, oh, yeah, this is the kind of shit I'm going to do with you today. He's going to be tortured. And then no later would I do that. He'd come in and say, oh, can we do something other than chest? I did it yesterday. And I'd be like, fuck. And so I have to start from scratch anyway. And what happens more often now is that they'll come in and maybe something happened at work and gosh, I can't, I don't have the use of my shoulder like I wanted to. And so that's when I got into injury recovery without going outside of the scope of my practice. But we talk about what the body's doing under injury, what we need to do to build the strength back up to help recuperate. That's a sidebar, but I hated, hated building workouts prior to my clients showing up for that reason. They'd always want to do something ass backwards from what I decided I wanted for them that day. So I've built it into my practice now. When my clients come in and talk to me, I spend the first five minutes, I'll put them on the row machine, put them on the Airdyne bike, what we call the assault bike at the CrossFit gym, 346 grit. If anybody in the local area want to come down and say hello, I'll put them on there. I'll just have them go for five minutes. They think they're warming up. I care less if they warm up in that manner or not. That's not really what their warm up is for me, but I put them on there because I want them to tell me everything that's going on in their lifestyle in the last seven days or whenever I saw them last. Maybe I see a person once a week. Sometimes I see people twice a week, ideally three to five times a week. But I want to find out what's going on with them. And as they're rowing or as they're on their bike, I can see them wince when they move their shoulder. I can see them go through a range of motion. That's why I love the row machine so much because it covers a wide range of motion. And I can look at them and I could see what's wrong. And if they don't bring it up, I'll bring it up. I'm like, hey, your right knee's buckling today on the row machine. What's going on? Oh, yeah, I tripped and I kind of twisted a little bit and now it's feeling funny. And so, hey, that great leg workout that I may have planned, that's out the window. Because I might change it to a different leg workout that's more reasonable for what they're going through. Or I might just go with an upper body workout that day. At the end of the day, a great workout takes you from point A to point B and achieves a result, a desired result. If you listen to the last podcast, I mentioned a lot about treat your body like a science experiment because that's what it is. We're biochemically changing the motor pathways in your body is when we work out. We're getting them to learn and adapt new muscle memory. We're getting them to break down tissue and rebuild structurally. We're going to work out, and we've got a plan for working out. We have to have a plan. I'm not saying don't have an overall plan. You need to have a goal. But a daily workout plan might change based on your need that day. And I learned this from great, great powerlifting coach, Westside Barbell Club over in Ohio. His name is Louis Simmons. And he'll have his main lift of the day. But he doesn't know what any of his accessory work is going to be until he goes through his motor skill work, his warm-ups, his movement preparation. And then he kind of finds through that what he needs to work on. Where's his weakness at that day? And then he works on that weakness. And that guy, he puts out power lifters. Uh, One guy just broke the deadlifting record in the United States, over 1,000 pounds, maybe like right around 1,100 pounds at the Arnold Classic. So... He knows what he's talking about. I always find ways of getting people that have the information that know more than me to learn from them, constantly building up my repertoire, and then I'm going to my client and learning by seeing them go through movement. But a successful workout for me is getting you from point A to point B 
and achieving the result that you desire. So one of my main questions then to jump off of that, Mike, it's something that I can go all the way back to high school. I was a track, I guess we'll call myself athlete. But I ran track. I did cross country. I tried to do the basketball thing, but when you're four feet tall, about 85 pounds, and the only thing you can do is take a charge or set a screen, your likelihood of being successful at basketball is very slim. Has its limitations. But I spent a lot of time in the gym trying to lift really heavy weights like you talked about before. I found it a huge accomplishment of being able to, I don't think it was in high school. I think my freshman year of college, I was able to bench my own weight, which felt like a pretty good accomplishment. But I found the older that I've gotten, I know for athletes, they have so many specialties. And I hear all the time, I'll watch these videos on YouTube. LeBron doing his workout or some professional, right? That's their job, is their body. And I know the CrossFit world is very much of a get in, get out. So I'd like to hear you talk about, because I very much have the mindset of I'm focused. I have specific goals, specific things I'm trying to do. And the thing that I think has driven me to want to do my workout at home rather than to go to the gym is because I want to be just like with everything that I do, everything that I do in life. I want to be as efficient as humanly possible to get in and get out and get on and do more things that I want to do. Not that I don't enjoy my workout, but I don't want to be in the gym for three freaking hours a day. And Jean is very different than me. She will be in the gym, and she has cut it down. I remember when we first started dating, I couldn't see her on Saturday. Or I couldn't see her on Sunday. I'd say, why? Well, I'm working out. I'm like, what? What, what, what do you mean? Like, you're work- well, I got this, and I got that, and I got that, and I got to do this, and I got it. It's like, do you really need to do the forearm raises for 45 minutes or whatever the hell you're doing? Like, I don't understand it but there's also a purpose for it and she has certain specific goals a certain specific look i know bodybuilders can spend hours almost a whole day in the gym but for me that's why i identify with not necessarily crossfit because for me the olympic lifting scares the bejesus out of me the trying to lift as much, it gets back into the high school days of trying to lift as much as I humanly possibly can. Now, I like the HIT workouts, the high intensity interval training. That's what I'm into. Now, I know that can also be dangerous because it's a lot of fast movements and a lot of jumping. And I actually, again, for myself, I modified it. Because when I was doing P90X, everything was great. But then my back started bothering me and my hips and my ankles and my feet. And I said, screw this. I'm just, if I have to jump, I'm just going to do an air squat. I'm just going to do an air squat. So I don't have that pressure on all of my joints. And I'm going to get roughly the same benefit. Because in reality, how many times am I jumping? Yes, when I'm running, it kind of has a little bit of that motion. But... When I have to run and I have to do those types of movements, then I do it then. So I know there's several different facets to it, but I would just love to hear from specifically a time standpoint. Maybe you can break it up, certain individuals, certain cases. It would also be great from a general person standpoint. Anybody who's listening to this, I. I don't think we necessarily have professional athletes or people that are in the gym all day, every day, listening to pause, think, consider while they're working out. But how is success quantified when it comes to time for working out? Well, it all comes down to biology. Your body can only endure so much before it undergoes a physical change. There's going to be a plateau. There's going to be a breaking point where 
you've done enough of that. You're not doing any more good. Is it quantifiable? Yeah, in some standards it is. But you know, like I was talking about Louis Simmons, he says if you're in and out an hour, you've almost gone a minute too long. You really shouldn't take more than an hour in a generalized workout from start to finish. We're talking about warm-up time included. CrossFit gyms, they have a great program. They set up the warm-up. They have what they do, the probably Olympic lifting or a weightlifting portion of some kind during the day. And then they have their WOD, which stands for workout of the day that could last anywhere between five and 30 minutes, sometimes up to an hour. For them, they have some wads that just take a long time, like some of our hero wads that just, Murph is a great example. We name our workouts in CrossFit. Murph is a hero wad. They made a movie. We'll link to that movie. So anyway, it's basically, if it takes you less than 45 minutes, you are a fire breather. You can absolutely annihilate your shit if you're able to get Murph done in, in less than 45 minutes. Most people take an hour, hour and 20, and it's traditionally done on Memorial Day, dedicated to our veterans. Listen, Greg Glassman, founder of CrossFit, says you should live in your couples and triplets, which means two to three exercises that are supersetted, running about five to ten minutes. Go long distance every once in a while. You shouldn't have these marathon workouts because then all you're doing is breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, and your body relies on the rest more than it relies on the work that you put in that day. So I've had a great workout where all I've gone in and done is one thing. I've gone in and I've done a chest press, for example, or a bench press, and I just worked on my bench press that day, worked on it for about 20 minutes, kicked my own ass, and I was done for the day. I didn't need to do anything else. I got my secondary muscle structure in there with the shoulders and the triceps, but my job was to blow out my chest. Not to mention I didn't have more than 30 minutes to work out that day anyway. So I know when I go in, I'm going to go in, I'm going to hit a main exercise. If I'm doing a bodybuilding style of workout, I'm going to hit a main exercise, whether it be the bench press, the squat, the deadlift, or the overhead press. And then I will have two to four accessory exercises after that, depending on my biggest area of weakness. And if you last more than an hour in a gym, you start to think about maybe I'm doing too much. The only time that people really benefit from spending more time in the gym are, I would argue to say that would be the body, the competition bodybuilders at the highest elite level where they're doing two a day, sometimes three a day workouts when they have to hit legs and chest on the same day. And so they break it up in between their protein shakes and mega mass builder blocks and things of that nature. So for us, for we, the people, the general population, if you're in there for more than an hour, probably too long. So let's talk about we're done with the workout. Maybe we even need to go back to the pre-workout also. So we can talk about both of these things. We can, we can combine them. So prior to working out, for some people, they're just going to get out of their car and they're going to jump right into it. I know for myself personally, that's very often how it typically be. And because of how I my dietary lifestyle, I very often will not eat beforehand. Or I'm running, which is probably why I try not to go very long with my workouts, is if I can, ideally, if I can, ideally, I will do my personal workout. I will try and end it right around the same time that correlates with eating. So I'm actually eating afterwards to try and help with the recovery of it. More than likely, because I only eat once every five to six hours, uh, I'm not eating beforehand. So either I try, I try and do it typically in the morning first thing when I wake up, which is basically coming off of a fast because I haven't eaten anything in 12 hours. I know it's hard for people to think about conceptually that I'm fasting, but that's what you're doing when you're sleeping. You're actually fasting. And so that's not normal. I know most people don't do that. So first part, what is a good pre-game, pre-workout? And then the second part to that, Mike, I'll never forget, he 
has an Olympic medal. His name is Galen Rupp. I had the opportunity in high school to actually run against him in cross country. And everybody knew at that time he was going to be amazing. I believe we're very close in age. So we're either the same age or maybe he's a year older. I was a freshman, sophomore. We're the same age. And I remember this interview. If I can find it, it's going to take a little bit of digging. But if I can find it, I will post it. But he talked about he was getting ready for the Olympics. He's an Olympic, at least bronze medalist. Maybe he has a silver. Maybe even one gold. I don't know. I don't watch TV. So he talked about what is it about the Kenyans specifically? Because they've been great at running. They dominate long-distance running. And what Galen talked about, he said, they have perfected rest. They are so good at rest. He said, when they have a rest day, like for us Americans, we think about sitting on the couch, watching TV, playing some video games. No, they are physically resting. They will sleep sometimes 16 hours a day, which seems unfathomable for us to be able to do. But as Mike alluded to, resting is what makes your workout great. And very often, and I am guilty of this, of burning at both ends of the candle, just going incredibly hard, which isn't a bad thing, overloading. We used to do it in high school. We'd have doubles for cross country. We'd do a morning workout and we'd have an afternoon. And we would only do it for two weeks. But it was high intensity to get us ready for the workload. And in theory, you should have been prepared for that. You were preparing for those daily doubles to put yourself through it. And it was going to help catapult you. At least that was the theory. I don't know that there's any science behind there. There's probably more. We're trying to drill into you the mental strength to be able to go through this cross-country season. I think it was more of that because football does it all the time. Football has training camps, and they do doubles all the time. But it is the rest and recovery that is a huge proponent. So I know it's two separate things, Mike, but I'd love to hear your thoughts first on pre-game, pre-workout preparation, and then post workout in relation to how can we make the actual work that we're doing, how can we make that successful? Well, I'll make it easier than that. It's not pre-game, post-game. It is change in lifestyle. And I just would rather talk about that because one of the fundamental problems that we can fall into, especially those that look out for trainers, I kind of mentioned to you about this over dinner, was people just want to come to me and say, hey, can you just build me a workout? I can't afford you, but can you just build me a workout? Can you just do something for me and just write something down on paper? Well, fuck, yeah, I could write anything on paper. Doesn't mean it's going to work for you. I mean, you could go online and find a thousand different workouts that'll work for you. And they're just a click away. You could download 42 different apps on your phone, each one of them having a different workout. Body weight workout, workout with weight, Wendler 531, the strong 5x5, you can do anything. Louis Simmons has his conjugate system. You can do anything you want. I've tried several of these workout plans, and in fact, Louis says, don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to working out. Louis system came from the Bulgarians. Bulgarians stole them from the Russians. The Russians stole them from the Mongolians. Like this workout that Louis Simmons puts people through, it's the same workout that they've been doing for hundreds of years. He hasn't done anything new, except he's perfected the rest. He goes one day on, one day off. One day on, two days off. CrossFit tapped into that a little bit, where they go three days on at the elite level, three days on, one day off, then two days on and one day off. So they manipulate their rest the same way. And their rest, gosh, have your meals already pre-planned because their rest should be rest. It shouldn't be movement very far away from what your overall lifestyle but how do we perfect the pre and the post? We have to make it a lifestyle change. We have to make it a decision. 
that this is who I am going to be to reach my goals. We're not in the gym and we're not going to come out and work out one day a week and expect any changes to occur. Now, I do have those clients that see me one day a week. And I tell them, if you're going to see me one day in the week, I expect your butt to be in the gym over at Crunch or over at LA Fitness or 24 two other days this week. Because what I do with you on this one day isn't going to catapult you into success. We might work on some functional movement. We might do some stuff. But it's not really going to make you successful. I actually had one of my favorite clients, one of my most inspirational clients. He's 86 years old. I've trained three generations of this guy's family. I got to know his granddaughters over at LA Fitness when I worked there. And his granddaughter is a bodybuilder. She goes around and does amateur shows. And she is a nutritionist. She's a hell of a nutritionist. And she's actually something I forgot to bring up last podcast, but she's the one that taught me that we don't eat enough food as humans, when, especially when we're trying to lose weight. We generally we cut too much calorie out of our system, and then our body struggles to keep up and then deposits fat. That's yesterday's podcast. So I digress. But I got to know her. She set me up to train her parents. So I trained her parents, and then on the side I would train her. And then she would show me some stuff that she learned through bodybuilding. So we'd kind of work out together. Her mom called Lou, which is her mom's dad. And Lou, he's this 86-year-old vet that played football and wrestled for Oregon State. He's broken every goddamn bone in his body. And he still wants to know what he can do to move better. What can I do? I can't lift my arms up over my shoulders. I'm having problems standing up now when I walk. I've got this drop foot syndrome. A whole list of things. I mean, he's by far one of my most challenging cases, and it makes it even more challenging. One, the fact that I've trained all three generations of this guy's family. But two, his daughter, his other daughter, who is one hour drive away, is a physical therapist. So... She sees the work that I've done with her sister and getting her to squat properly. And it took me two years to break that one, but it finally got her. And I've got this professional, like, I'm a professional in strength and fitness. And I work through injury recovery through my strength and fitness. And I learned a lot of what I know about injury recovery through Kelly Starrett, who is one of CrossFit's mobility gurus. Learned a lot from that guy. I always learn a lot from that guy. He's got a podcast called Mobility Watt. Website. Great website. So I've learned a lot about pressure techniques and things like that. And his mantra is that everybody should be able to have the common sense to be able to take care of their own shit. If you've got a stuck muscle or a stuck joint, you should be able to take care of it. And here's ways that you can make that happen. And he gives you the tools to do that. And he's a physical therapist. So I get Lou. And... I start working with them with the techniques learned through Kelly Starrett. And again, as a personal trainer, I got to be very careful about reaching outside of my scope of practice, which is physical therapy almost at this point with Lou. I'm not really allowed to touch the guy. I'm allowed to train him for strength training. But I show him the mechanisms of working and the range of motion that he should be allowed to carry or he should expect for himself, what with crippling arthritis that he's got, but I get a phone call from his daughter, the physical therapist up in Longview. And she said, hey, and this is after about a month of working with Lou. She goes, hey, I don't know what's going on. She goes, but we see some really big improvements on the way that dad is walking. And the fact that he could actually reach up and take something off the top counter. So I start talking to Lou. And you know what that guy does? He only sees me once a week. But he goes home and he does what I say. He puts into practice the things that I tell him, which I can tell you is a very, very small percent of the population of people that hire personal trainers. They always get too busy or too wound up, too tied up in themselves to actually do what's good for them and follow through with the workout. For Lou, it was a lifestyle change. I told him these are the movements that I expect you to do when you're at home, and most time when I send people home with movements, that movement pattern stays on the shelf and they never look at it until the next week and then expect miracles to happen. Nope. Lou goes home and he does his movements. He has made it a lifestyle change. And to be quite honest, how to make our successful 
pre and post workout it's just follow through it's preparation for the next workout knowing what do i got to do today but not only today but what is that going to lead me into doing tomorrow and am i going to have the balls enough to stick to my schedule stick to my guns and actually follow through with this really horrible workout that my trainer planned for me that he's not going to be there for to motivate me through am i going to be able to step out of my comfort zone and do this on my own and am i able to make it a lifestyle change and i will tell you that most people who see trainers again i fired a number of clients for not following through i can't want it worse for them i can't want it for them so if they make it a lifestyle change and then they follow through and do the things that I ask, we see success. And that does include time away from the gym. Like the girl that I talked about in our last podcast, I had to tell her to put on a brakes. Stop working out so much. You're killing yourself. And when she finally did that, actually by happy accident, she saw the results she was looking for finally. So I know you're looking for probably, Jesse, some more specificity in preparation like maybe you should drink this protein shake any of that other stuff is peripheral to just making the habit larry bird nobody can outwork larry bird ever they tried to show up at five in the morning to beat him to practice one day and he was already there shooting jump shots nobody got there earlier and nobody left later than larry bird he would shoot a thousand shots a day from the same spot just so he can make an improvement he made it a lifestyle if you want to be successful in your workout, you've got to make it a lifestyle choice. Again, you're not working out just so you can get on a treadmill and burn a few calories. If that's what you're doing, but more power to you. Maybe you just want to get some pheromone, maybe get that happy feeling of, gosh, I just got a little workout, a little sweat going. That makes you feel good. Great. If that's what your desired result was, it's just to sweat a little and feel happy about yourself for a day. Great. But if your desired result is to see body composition change, which I would argue to say most people that see me have that desire. And when I talk about body composition change, I talk about fat loss or muscle gain. When they come to see me for that, they have to make it a lifestyle choice and follow through when I'm not with them. I think not everybody is built in the manner, as we've already talked about, both of us, which is why I think we get along so well, both of us have a mentality of when we say we're going to do something, we follow through and we do it. Somebody that makes it their job, their livelihood to utilize their body, they're able to follow through. They don't miss workouts. They don't skip meals. They make sure they get enough to rest. They're not out there getting bombed with their buddies because they know that the ramifications of it are going to come back and hinder all of the work that they just put in. But we're talking about elite mindset individuals. Individuals that make your job easy, Mike. That they walk in and you go, Cool. I can work on the fun things. I don't have to work on the motivation. So if we're going to try and simplify it down, take take those individuals out of it. Right? Anything you're going to have outliers. So take the outliers out of it. The easy ones. Right? We're not talking about easy ones. We're talking about people that you have to work. And let's try and tag team this. Let's try and get, you're, you're somebody that's struggling. You know somebody that's struggling. To figure out what that successful workout is for you. What's three things that we can collectively come up with to help create, sustain, and achieve a successful workout? That's a good question. The mindset is everything. And when I'm dealing with somebody whose mindset is, God, 
had a crappy day, had a crappy week. I got no energy. I don't even know why I'm here today. Then my mindset is, okay, we just got to get you through the day. We got to make you do something that you didn't realize you had the strength or energy to do. And that happens a lot. We have busy lives. We have jobs that take a toll on us. We sit behind a desk for 9 to 12 hours a day after not moving all day long or going to a gym and are expected to lift heavy things fast. I do teach Olympic lifts. I know they scare the hell out of you for good reason. People do them badly. They get hurt. We saw a guy in the Olympics this year that just demolished his right arm doing a snatch. And this guy is a professional, way better at it than I am. And he suffered a severe career-ending injury from doing it. So what do I do? What's one thing I do is I find what their motivation needs to be that day. And if it's getting you through a workout after a long, hard week, it is basically let's give them a challenge that they don't even know is a challenge until they get through it. And then they can turn around and say, oh, look at the shit I just got done doing. To key off of that, for number two, I'm going to go with, and I think this can really apply. This is great from a workout sense. Number one that you talked about, Mike, about having that mindset. I think you can apply that to anything. And that's where I'm going to try and piggyback that. And I'm going to say that to be successful at your workout, to have a successful workout, to have a successful workout plan, you need to engage in ongoing regularly occurring education. Whether that's getting it from somebody else like Mike or doing it through self-exploration. I know when Mike and I have conversations off air together, it's fun because we're able to speak a lot of the same language. But I didn't go through the same training that Mike did. He went through something much more formal than I did. And it's the same thing when I go and I talk to my chiropractor. I try, not necessarily in the sense, and I've used this before, about being a chameleon, but any arena of life that you go into, I think this is not to get political, but I think a lot of the issues we have is we're just not able to communicate on the same language. We're not on the same sheet of music. We have immigrants that come in. We're not able to communicate with them. When we go to other countries, we're seen as pompous ass Americans because we're not able to communicate with them on their level. And so for me to get the most out of my relationship with a personal trainer, and it's second nature to me just because I try and do that in any walk of life. Whether it's with music, whether it's with business, whether it's with cooking, or fitness. I want to be able to talk the talk. I might not know how to apply the walk, but that's why I have somebody that's a professional that knows what the hell they're doing. And they're able to provide that. But... We have zero excuses anymore for not being able to get the knowledge. Zero. Before I even, and his name is, to get it right, Kelly Starrett. I discovered Kelly Starrett on freaking YouTube. It wasn't for Mike. For Mike, he's, whether Kelly knows it or not, huge influence on Mike's life. And I discovered Kelly and learned about what he does based on YouTube, based on Googling, just having that human nature of, I want to learn more. And so I would say as a second step, yes, the mindset, absolutely. You have to have the mindset. But number two, you have to have this hunger to get knowledge. If you want to lose weight, great, leverage Mike. Leverage him. But then, not only do you need to do what he tells you when you are off the air, when you're not in a session with him, 
But if you're really, truly serious about seeing the results, you got to be able to throw more challenges to him. I can imagine the look on his face when I'm rowing, and I go, gosh, my TFL is really tight right now. I've got my interior rotator on my hip. It's just, it's pulling in this manner, Mike. I really don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to get the range of motion that I need in my left hip. I, I went on this car ride and I sat really funny and I'm just locked up. It feels like I'm pinching in my hip there. I don't have the range of motion I'm looking for. He's going to go, holy shit. I know exactly. I can pinpoint that. I know what to do. And we've done it before. I've got, gosh, Mike. I'm trying to do a freaking squat the way that you show me to, but my toes are rolling out. I feel my my hips are locked up. I'm not able to get it. It feels almost like my groin's too tight. And then we found the stretch. Da-da! It was like the skies parted open and angels were coming down. And magically, I remember I texted him. I called him. I go, Mike, I found this stretch, and it freaking kills me. But I've been doing it for two weeks. I'm going to pop a squat no matter where the hell we were. And it happened to be at Whole Foods out in public. And I dropped the squat right in front of me. And he went, holy shit. What the hell did you do, Leapman? What did you do? How did you do it? Because I need And I said, oh, I did X, Y, and Z stretch. I did this because it helps rotate this out. And it kills this and blah, blah, blah. And we were all on the same sheet of music. And now he goes and he leverages it. And that makes it fun. It makes it fun not only for myself. But it makes it fun for Mike. And if you enjoy what you do, and we all know this from our jobs, if you hate waking up in the morning, going to work, you're probably not going to be that successful. There's some people that are able to turn it on, and I really admire those individuals, that you hate life, and you go on the bus, and you want to do put a paper bag over your head, but you walk in the office, and you're able to turn it on, and somehow fool the boss that you want to be there and you perform. You're probably not performing to your best. And it's the same thing with working out. So if you take a personal interest in gathering as much information as possible, then you've got a soundboard. And I don't care if it is having a personal trainer or you're in a workout group or somebody in the gym. Maybe I'm just the weird guy. I don't know. But If I'm trying to get big biceps like the dude who's got giant freaking biceps in the gym, I walk up to him like, dude, tell me. So I've been, I've been trying hammer curls and I've been doing a superset and then I'm dropping down and I'm doing, here's, I'm doing five reps, three reps. Then I take a minute 15. What is your secret? And I'm probably going to find out genetic wise. He comes from the gorilla ape background, and there's nothing that my Neanderthal background is going to be able to replicate. He's just, he has a gift. But now we have a dialogue, and I have more information, and I am that much more passionate about it, which is going to make my workouts more successful. So mindset, continuing education, and to wrap it up, Mike, well, I just want to key into what you said about continuing education and learning from other people. Hey, listen, I know you don't like the word expert, but I know you listen to Tim Ferriss and you watch a lot of his stuff and read his books. He said in his first book that an expert is simply somebody that knows more than you do about a particular subject. And I think that's element here. I think when you have that knowledge, not only are you able to share that with your trainer, but you're able to share that with somebody that hasn't been where you're at. Like you were able to help me. You're able to help clients of mine through that stretch that you showed me. And you came to me for help. And you ended up finding, called it the fountain. What did you call it? You had a a catchphrase. like the. It wasn't the fountain of youth. It was, ah, I forgot what you said about it. But it was fantastic. It was like you said, the skies parted for you. And the third thing is, for me, and you brought it up on our last podcast, but this is more directed towards talked about finding that support group in our last podcast together and in this case share your knowledge so you're given knowledge and that's a gift whether you pay for it otherwise knowledge is gift it's our gift of life there's 
all sorts of information. Whether you learn from Arnold, I've got his Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding at Home, the original version. It's a fantastic book. Very well written. Very to the point. He's got workouts in there, but he tells you every exercise under the sun and how to do it correctly and what you're trying to feel in the exercise when you do it. He has discussions about supersets and Johnny sets, and all sorts of different drop sets, specialty movements that you can do to encourage the girth of your workout or whatever you're trying to accomplish. Anyway, it's fantastic. I read that. I probably pick it up two or three times a week. I've owned it for 20 years. I love that book. And I still read it and still learn something new from it every time I pick it up. I've got an illustrated book from an amazing, I believe he's a physical therapist also, but he's a bodybuilder, physical therapist, Francois Delevere. And he has this illustrated book called The Strength Training Anatomy. What a mind blown that I got when I picked up that book. It was fantastic. He literally unfolds the layers of skin and fatty tissue away so it strip right down to each individual muscle that you might be working in a movement. And he tells you the good and the bad and the indifferent during that movement. And it's fantastic just to be able to see what you're able to do. And I hosted a class at 346 Great CrossFit every Saturday for six weeks where it was based off of his concept, Francois Delevere's concept of strength training anatomy. Hey, let's not just come in and move. Let's come in and move and know why we're moving. And that's the whole reason behind CrossFit's functional movement system is that we got to know why we're doing what we're doing. So that way, when you get that knowledge, when you start getting that deep understanding of the systems like Jesse was talking about a moment ago, and you can pass that knowledge on to somebody that needs the help that you needed before you learn that knowledge, then it comes full circle. And it's kind of a pay it forward system in fitness. Yeah, I, to bounce off of that right before we wrap things up, Mike. I've always had the personal belief, and I've heard it from a lot of people in our personal circle together that we share, that those that have the ability to teach are able to showcase how much they actually know the material. If you can teach something, and I know there's the other People like to use it, oh, if you can't do, you teach. Bullshit. If you can teach somebody to do something, that shows you have a mastery level education and understanding of what it is you're teaching. And as a result, somebody else benefits from it, pay it forward, but it helps reinforce for yourself. Because oftentimes when you describe it to somebody else, you may not be aware, you may not realize that you're doing that. You might just know the principles or the theory, and now you're able to take it out of body, third person, and have somebody essentially doing what you're supposed to, and now you have a visual, because everybody learns differently. Everybody learns differently. I'm a very visual, process-oriented individual. For other people, they might like it written out. They might like it told to them, verbally. But if you're able to take something, you're able to take something that Mike tells you, how to actually squat, you're able to tell somebody else and have them be successful, the likelihood that you're able to do it yourself is that much greater. So in recap, we have talked about the topic today of how to have a successful workout. Mike gave a whole bunch of information about influences that he's had in his life, how he got into physically being a personal trainer, and what it actually means when he has a client and for them to be successful. We've had discussions in regards to workloads specifically because there's some individuals that feel like they have to be in the gym for five hours. And there's other people, very much a CrossFit movement, that they are in and out, taking care of business, high intensity, potentially even high load, very quickly. And then we also talked about the subject of pre and post workout, and that really, as Mike described it, it's a lifestyle. It's not pre, it's not post. 
It is a lifestyle. It is creating that lifestyle that allows you to be successful at your workouts. Yes, do you need to consume food? Yes, do you need to rest? And if you have specific questions about it, I will link to Mike's site that he has personally. Feel free to reach out to him. He has individuals that he walks through this on a daily basis. It's what he does for a living because everything's going to be unique to yourself. What he tells me for advice is going to be different than what he tells you. It's all personalized. And if you're going through and you're not getting personalized information or at least adapting it to yourself, your workout's probably not going to be as successful as it possibly could be. And then we gave you three steps to ensuring you have a successful workout. First one, as Mike talked about, being getting into the right mindset. Making sure that you're in the right mindset. And if you're not, finding an individual like Mike that can put you in that mindset. And sometimes when we've got a whole bunch of shit going on, it's just getting through. Getting into the mindset that I can just cross the finish line. The second thing I talked about specifically was that continuing education. Learn whatever it is. If you don't want to apply it to work out, working out, being successful at working out, continuing education. Find as much information as you possibly can so that you can speak the language of the other individual. It's going to help engage you more, and you're going to enjoy it that much more, too. And the third and final thing, as Mike said, is to find that support group. Find those individuals that you can bounce ideas off of and then pay it forward. Pay it forward. Take the knowledge that you've gained, whether it's in this podcast, whether it's in other podcasts, whether it's other information you have amongst your lives. We become very, very selfish with our information. I struggle with this personally. But Again, if we're able to teach it, if we're able to pass it on, we pay it forward. It's not a competition. It's reinforcing for ourselves what it is we're trying to do, and it's helping impact and encourage other people in their goals, their initiatives, their missions. I want to thank you all for tuning in today, sharing another podcast with my dear friend Mike Eford. For more information on this topic, you can go to our website, pausethinkconsider.com slash workout. And I look forward to talking to you all again on Pause, Think, Consider.